All right. Uh, so uh, I'd like to thank organizers, especially Nina and uh, Eric, for inviting me to contribute to the summer school. And uh, as you see, the title is slightly changed. Uh, it was about, uh, originally it was about uh, quantum hall systems, but now uh, the changed the last part. But, uh, But uh, first of all, what is a uh, quantum computer? Uh, any quantum computer is formed of two uh, ingredients. Uh, first, uh, it contains quantum memory. And uh, quantum memory is nothing but the uh, Hilbert space and uh, vector uh, fields in the Hilbert space. And uh, quantum memory. Uh, we need to process uh, and uh, change the memory by time. So uh, we need uh, information processing, and information processing can be accessed by acting uh, on these vectors by unitary matrices. So uh, with, two, with these uh, two things, uh, we can obtain a quantum computer. But what is, the, uh, what is so special about quantum computer? We know that some quantum algorithms are much more efficient than their classical analogs. And the most famous example is the Shor's algorithm for uh, factoring of uh, large numbers. But the major issue with quantum uh, systems is that they are so fragile and very sensitive to disorder, to interaction, uh, thermal fluctuations, and uh, we don't have much control over them. So uh, this uh, was a big obstacle uh, for making quantum computers. But in uh, 1997, uh, Alexei Kitayev came up with a very beautiful idea that could resolve this problem. And uh, he proposed that if we take a topological system, which is robust by definition, uh, then we don't have this quantum decoherence, at least at low enough temperature. Uh, temperature much smaller than the uh, bulk gap. And by doing that, we can obtain a system whose uh, quantum memory is robust, and we also have uh, so much control over information processing. So we have a fault-tolerant uh, quantum computer. Okay, uh, in the first lecture, I will uh, discuss three examples, three topological examples that uh, the first two examples are not uh, quite good for quantum computations, but they are good uh, to understand uh, other examples that I will give you in the afternoon, which are more uh, powerful for quantum computation. And at the end of this lecture, uh, I will uh, talk more about topological order, what do we mean by topological order, what are the defining properties of a uh, topological phase. Okay, uh, what do we mean by a topological phase? A topological phase is a phase whose bulk is gapped. So uh, there is a non-zero uh, gap uh, to uh, all excitations inside the bulk. And the edge is uh, gapless and usually chiral. And such systems uh, can be characterized by topological invariance. For example, for integer quantum Hall cases, uh, we can index uh, the system by the so-called Chern number, which is a topological index. And uh, for interacting systems, where we have uh, intrinsic topological order, the bulk theory in two-dimensional uh, space is described by uh, Chern-Simons field theory, which is a topological field theory. The system has uh, non-trivial ground state degeneracy when we wrap it on uh, different uh, manifolds. For example, if we put it on torus, the ground state degeneracy is uh, more than one. And the system shows the so-called the edge state of the system has the so-called chiral anomaly, which means uh, electron number is not conserved at the edge. So edge and bulk, they exchange particle. And uh, it's uh, very related to the uh, spectral flow. And the system is robust uh, as long as there is no uh, gap closing. 
But if gap closes, uh, then uh, at the gap closing point, we have singularity and phase transition happens, and when gap reopens, we make it uh, a different topological phase. When you say a phase transition, just transfer into a, like a conducting phase? Uh, sorry, you're asking about uh, yeah, the, 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 the last one. You went oh, this one? Yeah. What was the phase that you go to? Oh, uh, there is a new phase. We don't know. Uh, for any uh, problem, we should uh, look into the specifics oh, and we should answer that. But in general, phase transition happens when gap closes. That's the requirement for phase transition. Are you, are you talking about uh, integer phases or fraction phases? Uh, both. Uh, in, in the uh, morning lecture, I will mostly focus on non interacting systems. Yeah. And in the afternoon, I will talk about interacting systems. There is no degeneracy in the morning. Uh, for, for the morning session, uh, there is no degeneracy except for the last part. Okay. So uh, I will mention three examples uh, this morning. Uh, the first example would be uh, the uh, one-dimensional dimerized chain or the Sushiriker model. Uh, it's a very simple model. Uh, it's a non-interacting and type-binding model. Uh, these points are atoms, and electrons on atoms can hop to uh, neighboring uh, sites. The hopping amplitude would be A for every other uh, link. And uh, between them, the hopping amplitude is B. So we have this asymmetric uh, hopping uh, amplitude. But what is the matrix element? Uh, what is the matrix representation of this Hamiltonian? Uh, it's very simple. Uh, on the diagonal, we have 0. Uh, let's say chemical potential is 0. And uh, we have A, B, A, B, because this side, side 1, can hop to side 2 with amplitude B, A, but side 2 can hop to side 3 with amplitude B. Uh, and we have to put B in this side and this side because we have a periodic chain. The system can be easily solved. For example, you can use Fourier transform and obtain the energy spectrum. An energy spectrum in this case uh, has this feature. There is a non-zero gap which is proportional to the uh, absolute value of A minus B. Uh, I assume A and B are both uh, positive in this system. So if I put chemical potential here at zero, for example, all negative energy states are occupied. So I show them with uh, this color. And uh, all positive energy states are empty. And this system is insulator because if I want to excite any electron which occupy these bands, I have to put at least this much energy into the system. Otherwise, they cannot be excited. So I have a and insulator. But what happens if I uh, cut the system at some point and obtain a, an open chain? Uh, you can see that we have uh, two ways of doing that. We can cut somewhere where we have link A, or we can cut uh, in another point where we have link B. OK, uh, the Hamiltonian associated with this picture is very similar to what we had before except for these two points. I had B at this uh, entry, uh, but now I put zero because this side, can, electrons on this side cannot hop back into this side. OK, you may say Hamiltonian is not changed much, so uh, nothing will change. But we will see, and you can use, for example, MATLAB uh, to check that the spectrum uh, has two different qualitative behavior. When A is larger than B, the spectrum looks pretty much like what we had before. Uh, states change a little bit, but that's uh, not uh, a qualitative change. But when A is less than B, we actually obtain two zero modes, two zero energy states, which are there uh, as long as A is less than B. It doesn't depend on the ratio. It doesn't depend on the uh, value of A and B. It just depends on this condition. So we obtain two zero modes for this system when A is less than B, and this is some robust feature. So I call it a topological property of this system because it doesn't go away uh, by changing A and B. Only when A becomes equal to A 
a, a becomes equal to B, so, so the gap uh, closes. At that point, I may uh, change this behavior. How can I understand this zero? Uh, the simplest way is to go to extreme limits. So let's take B equals zero limit and A equals zero limit. For B equals zero, the matrix that we had before becomes very simple. If I turn off B, I have a bunch of uh, two by two matrices. So my matrix becomes block diagonal. And each block can be uh, diagonalized very easily. Uh, so what it gives me uh, is a negative energy and a positive energy. Uh, and I occupy the negative energy, which means I have this dimerization between side one and two. They can hop to each other. But there is no hopping between side two and three. So uh, I get this picture. For the other case, where A is 0 and B is non-zero, site 2 can hop to site 3 because B is non-zero, but site 1 cannot hop to site 2. So 1 and 2 are separated. There is no way of connecting site 1 to site 2. And if you look at the Hamiltonian, you will see that when A is 0, I have a 0 here, and I have one matrix here, one here, one here. Uh, so I have a bunch of 2 by 2 matrices except for this point and this point where I have 0. So I have two exactly 0 nodes for this limit. But this feature is robust and if we change A a little bit, this uh, 0 node doesn't go away. Uh, for, for this extreme case, the wave function is delta uh, function. It's, it lives only at this point for 0 node or this point. But when A is non-zero, the wave function is not a uh, delta uh, function, but it's still localized. The, most of the weight is around this point, or this point, two edges of the system. And as an exercise, uh, I want you to study the low energy limit of this problem, go to the continuum limit, and uh, you can show that the system is described by two massive uh, Dirac cones, one has mass A plus B, and one has mass A minus B. So now imagine we have a domain wall between this region and this region. In this region, A is less than B, so mass is negative for one Dirac cone. For the other, is positive. And in this region, B is less than A, so mass is positive for, for one Dirac cone. For the other, is, it, it's still positive. So let's forget about the sector which doesn't change uh, mass sign. But for the sector whose mass is proportional to A minus B, we, we obtain a massive Dirac cone whose mass changes sign from negative to positive. And this uh, reduces to the famous uh, Jackie Ruby soliton model. And you can solve it exactly analytically and obtain zero modes. So the zero modes exist here because of this Jackie Ruby soliton model. Okay, let's go to the second example topological superconductors and uh, Majorana fermions, which are there. But before that, let me spend uh, two minutes on superconductivity itself. I know that there are some high energy physicists here, so I try to pick their language. What is a conductor? Yeah. Uh, uh, sorry, I just pulled on a previous slide. So if we consider like the uh, interaction A, B, C, I mean, not just A, B, so can I get a, like the two surface state, two thermal, I mean, here is AB, right? If you if change, I, right. If, if, if you change yeah, Hamiltonian, sure. you will get a different answer. So what you're saying is if I have A here, B here, C here, uh -huh. then your matrix is three by three, right? And then you get three bands instead of two bands. So uh, between each band, you, you may or may not get zero. I don't know, but it's, yeah. So A and B are tunable. You can actually turn it, so you can actually change them from one place to the other. If, if you can manage doing that in experiment, you, you should be able to see this. Uh, okay, so what is superconductivity? First of all, uh, we know that conductors are defined in this way. Current is proportional to the electric field itself. So if we turn off electric field, there is no current. So J is zero. But the definition of a superconductor is this. Instead of J being proportional to E, the derivative of J is proportional to E, which means if I turn off electric field, current is not zero. 
current doesn't change because dj over dt is zero. But j itself is, is, is not zero. So this is the definition of a superconductor. There is no electric field. There is no battery connected to the system, but I get current. OK, on the other hand, we know that electric field is related to the vector potential and scalar potential. We can pick a gauge such that scalar potential is 0. So electric field is minus dA over dt. Let's plug in this into this relation. So dJ over dt equals sigma e equals minus dA over dt times sigma. Therefore, J is proportional to A. So in this, for conductors, J is proportional to E, but for superconductors, J is proportional to A. But what does this mean? We know that current in, in action formalism or Lagrangian, uh, current is proportional to the variation of Lagrangian with respect to the gauge field. And this must be equal to minus sigma A to the lowest order. So J is proportional to A. But what does this mean for the action? Action must contain this term, sigma a squared, because its derivative gives us sigma a. OK, action has this term. But this term breaks gauge symmetry, because uh, gauge symmetry is defined in this way. And if we add this term to the Lagrangian, gauge symmetry is broken, and this term provides mass to photons. So photons become massive. So this is a very important point. Whenever we have this term in the Lagrangian, we obtain a superconductor. But how can we get this term in the Lagrangian? First of all, let's consider a, an operator with charge Q. So I have some quantum operator whose charge is Q. And we know that under gauge transformation, this operator changes in this way. It picks a non-zero phase proportional to its uh, charge. So the average of this operator must transform in this way as well if you have gauge symmetry. But what does this mean if you have gauge symmetry? This must be equal to this, because this gauge transformation is something unphysical. Before and after phase transition, you must get the same answer. So average of O must be equal to this factor times average of O, which means either Q must be 0 or the average of O must be 0. On the converse, if we have an, a charge operator whose average is non-zero, it means the gauge symmetry is broken. So when gauge symmetry is broken, Lagrangian has this term. And when Lagrangian has this term, we have a superconductor. So in order to get a superconductor, we just need to condense a charged operator. Very simple. OK, electron operator is charged. It carries charge. But unfortunately, we cannot condense it because it's a thermal. However, if we take two electrons, the two, two electrons behave more or less like a boson, and we can condense it. And it's charged. So if you condense two electrons, that is a Cooper pair, then gauge symmetry is broken. And when gauge symmetry is broken, I can add this term to the, to the Lagrangian. And because of this term, current is proportional to A. And because of that, I get this relation. So I have a superconductor. Very simple. OK. Now so let's focus on a special kind of superconductors. Yes? Uh, so are, are, you, are you talking about a zero temperature? Uh, uh, no, it's not zero temperature in any state. So, so you, have some ground, you have some state, right? And if that operator has non-zero average with respect to that state, then gauge symmetry is broken on that state. Yeah, no, what I was a bit confused. Uh, so Conductivity is a dissipative term, right? How can you write on the Lagrangian for that? A zero temperature may be okay, but uh, I don't quite understand your uh, question. But uh, I guess at any temperature, you can write an effective Lagrangian for the system. But, uh, well, anyway, the term he has is non dissipative, so it's okay. There is a non dissipative term even at the right temperature. Oh, the superconducting form. Yes. Yeah. OK, so let's focus on a special kind of superconductor in 2D. Uh, I will not talk much about uh, what P plus IP means. But let's assume we have the system. And if we uh, find the spectrum of the system, we get two bands with a non-zero gap between them, negative energy states and positive energy states. And they are symmetric because we have particle symmetry. 
And negative energy states are fully occupied because chemical potential for superconductors is zero. And uh, higher states are empty. So this is a, uh, in, in some sense, it's, it's like it's an insulator. And ground state is unique because uh, up to this point, I have to occupy every state. There is no degree of freedom left. Okay, so I, I can construct my ground state only in one way. But now, let's imagine we have two vortices in the system. With two vortices, no, two vortices. We cannot have a single vortex in a superconductor because quantum of flux is hc over e, not hc over 2. So we have to have at least two vortices in the system. For every two vortices, we can uh, solve the spectrum, and the spectrum has a single zero mode, not two, just single. For two vortices, I have a single zero energy state. Okay, what does this mean? In this situation, uh, how can I get the ground state? Chemical potential is here, so I have to occupy these states for sure because they have negative energy. How about this one? At this point, energy is zero. So if I occupy this state, or if I don't occupy it, I get the same energy. The total energy is the same. So I have two different states with the same total energy. This state, the zero mode, can be occupied or unoccupied by uh, fermions. And in both cases, I get the same total energy. So I have two-fold degenerate ground state, zero and one. Honestly, in this case, ground state degeneracy is one because the uh, parity uh, is conserved for, for superconductors. Electron number is conserved mod two. But let's imagine we have other vortices in the system, so I just want to focus on this part of the system. Okay, so I have uh, the two-fold ground state degeneracy because of these two vortices. That's something important. What about the wave function? If I get uh, the wave function for the system, if I calculate it, the wave function has two peaks. One is near vortex one, and one is uh, near vortex two for that zero. But let's use this trick. The wave function uh, is more or less independent of the distance of two vortices. So it has this shape and this shape near these two vortices, and between them it's very small. It's almost zero. So I can say my wave function is formed of two parts, part which is concentrated around vortex 1 and part which is concentrated around vortex 2. And I call the first one gamma 1, the, first, the, the second one gamma 2. And in this way, I can fractionalize my electron wave function. So I have a single wave function, but I want to treat each part of it as an independent uh, particle. The first part I call gamma 1, and the second part I call gamma 2. To be more precise, Gamma is obtained in this way. Yeah. But quick question: uh, at Which part from uh, previous slide did you utilize the fact that it's a p plus i p zero? Uh, the fact that I assumed uh, for every two vortices I get the zero mode. Okay. If I have a, a, an S-wave superconductor, uh, the, uh, I won't get a zero mode. There is no zero mode for S. -wave. So p plus i p in the weak pairing phase guarantees getting that zero mode. Okay. Uh, more formally, gamma 1 and gamma 2 are defined uh, in this way in terms of electron operator. So C12 creates one electron which is shared between vortices 1 and 2. So I define gamma 1 as C plus C dagger and gamma 2 as C minus C dagger divided by I. And you can show using these definitions that gamma 1 squared equals gamma 2 squared equals 1 and I gamma 2 gamma 1 equals minus 1 to the number of fermions. Okay, uh, but can we define a Hilbert space just associated with gamma 1? The answer is no. Gamma 1 by itself is not physical. Basically because we cannot have a single vortex in the nature. And in order to see this, uh, you can easily see that gamma 1 doesn't have vacuum. So it's not a well-defined operator. Why, does it, why it doesn't have vacuum? Because let's imagine it has a vacuum. So gamma one or two on vacuum gives us zero by definition. But on the other hand, gamma one squared must be one. So if I act on this by gamma one again, then gamma one squared on vacuum must give me on one hand vacuum itself because gamma one squared is one, but on the other hand, it must give me zero. And I get inconsistency. 
this operator, uh, this uh, state is normalized to one, but this is zero. So I get an inconsistency. So a single Majorana fermion is unphysical. However, if I take two Majorana fermions, gamma one and gamma two, together, I can define a well-defined Hilbert space. So I can form gamma one plus a gamma two, which gives me the original C12. And uh, for that, I can define Hilbert space, because this acting on zero, which is equal to C acting on zero, gives me zero. But zero is not zero, you know? I mean, zero state is not zero number. OK, so I need uh, two of my run of fermions to define a uh, Hilbert space, a physical Hilbert space. How about uh, exchange statistics? So if I have two electrons and I exchange them, the wave function after exchange picks up a negative sign with respect to the original wave function. How about my run of fermions? This situation is slightly different because I have vortices as well. So this problem is not a problem of fermions. This is a problem of bound state between fermions and vortices. This is very important to know. If you have just vortices and, and uh, wind them around each other, we don't get uh, anything uh, unspecial if they don't carry zero mode. But when we have zero modes attached to these uh, vortices, then we may get something non-trivial. OK, I told you that there is a zero mode associated with these two vortices, which can be occupied or unoccupied. So there is either a boson, no electron, or a fermion, one electron, associated with these two vortices, which lives almost between them, right? So what happens if I exchange vortex 1 and 2? Exchanging vortex 1 and 2 is equal, is equivalent, to rotating this zero mode between them by 2 pi. It's like taking the zero mode and rotating by 2 pi. Because if you sit in the center, you, you will see something like that. OK, uh, but what happens uh, to the phase? You, will s you can easily see that if the zero mode is unoccupied, so it's a boson, and if I take a boson around itself, it doesn't change sign. So the sign chain is zero. So zero goes to zero. Zero state means no electron. It's a boson. But if I have a fermion in the zero mode, then if I rotate it by 2 pi around itself, I get a negative sign, because it's a fermion by definition. So I have two different situations. And the answer is not unique. The answer depends on the occupation of this zero mode. And because of that, I get a non-abelian statistics. Why is it non-abelian? Uh, because of uh, this fact. Let me uh, show you this first. OK, imagine I have a linear combination of 0 and 1 state. So I have alpha 0 plus beta 1. And if I exchange the two vortices, then 0 doesn't change sign, but beta changes sign. So I get alpha 0 minus beta 1. But I cannot write this as some phase times the original state. On this alpha or beta is zero. OK, so, so this is not just a phase multiplied by this state. This is like matrix uh, multiplied by a vector. OK, uh, so we just saw that the state picks up a phase which depends on its occupation. But uh, you remember that i gamma 2 gamma 1 was equal to this operator. So the state changes to by, by this operator. So this is an operator. This is like a matrix. So I get a non-abelian statistic because this is a matrix. It, may, it, it can be diagonalized in this basis, but in general, it is not diagonal. OK, how about four vortices? What if I have four vortices? I have vortex 1 and 2, vortex 3 and 4. For vortex uh, 1 and 2, I get one zero mode, as before. And for vortex 3 and 4, I get another zero mode. So in, th so in this case, I have two zero modes. So what about vortex 1 and 3 and 2 and 4? They cannot be paired. That's a very good question. I will get uh, to that in a moment. OK? I have it here. Oh, just to share. So I, I have a degree of freedom. Actually, what, what I have for this system it's just for, for the whole thing, I have two zero modes. And uh, because I have a degenerate space, I can choose my basis, right? 
I will choose a basis where gamma 1 and gamma 2 here gives me this one, and gamma 3 and gamma 4 gives me that. But any linear combination of that you can pick. You can, for example, go to a different basis where vortex 2 and 3 are paired, and 1 and 4. That's up to you. But once you fix the uh, choice, then you should work with that. OK, I can write my uh, ground state as n1, 2, and n3, 4 in this basis. And n1, 2 can be 0 or 1, n3, 4 can be 0 or 1. So I have in total four different states, all with the same energy, because uh, occupying these states don't change uh, energy. OK, uh, how i gamma 2 gamma 1 acts on this space? i gamma 2 gamma 1 is diagonal in this basis, so it just gives me a number. Also, gamma 4 gamma 3 gives me a number, because it's diagonal in this basis. But i gamma 3 gamma 2 in this basis is not diagonal. Why? Because this doesn't commute with this operator and this operator. They anti-commute. And because they anti-commute, they cannot be uh, diagonal, diagonalized simultaneously. So when this acts on this state, it's not just a number times this state. It's a linear combination of different states. So this uh, is a very important point. We will use it later. OK, so what we saw is when we have two n vortices, we get n zero modes. And each zero mode can accommodate one or zero electrons. So it's like a qubit. So the ground state degeneracy is 2 to the n. And 2n is, is number of vortices. So I get n quantum bits by having 2n vortices. And they are robust. Why they are robust? Because for every two vortex, I get one qubit. And this qubit, this information, is stored non-locally between two distant objects, between gamma 1 and gamma 2. So information is not in one particular point of the space. And because of that, perturbation cannot uh, change the information because it's not stored in one point. It's stored between two different uh, vortices. OK, but uh, how about exchange of statistics for four vortices instead of two? For four vortices, uh, we actually have uh, more than, we have two different types of exchanges. But before that, uh, if we exchange, if we braid, uh, this is actually half braid. Uh, vortices i and j in some state, it's like acting this operator on that state. You remember that, right? When we had vortices i and j, the braid was like acting this operator on this state. So this operator can be diagonalized in the basis or uh, off diagonal. For this type of exchange, it's diagonal. Because the Hilbert space uh, that I have chosen, the uh, basis that I have chosen, has n1, 2. So gamma 2, gamma 1 is diagonal in that basis. And also 3 and n3, 4. So gamma 3, gamma 4 is also diagonal in that basis. So if I exchange 1 and 2, or 3 and 4, only the phase of the state changes. So the state picks a non-trivial phase. That's it. If I exchange 1 and 2, or 3 and 4. But what if I exchange 2 and 3? If I exchange 2 and 3, then I have to multiply this state by i gamma 3 gamma 2. But i gamma 3 gamma 2 is not diagonal in this basis. Because it's not diagonal, when this acts on this state, it doesn't give me just a phase. It gives me a linear combination of different states. For example, uh, but how can we uh, calculate the answer? The simplest way is to basis is the basis transformation. Go to an, to another basis where gamma three, gamma two, and gamma one, gamma four are diagonal. We can find that basis. Compute this in that basis and then transfer back to the original basis. The final answer, for example, for this state b two three on zero zero, will be this entangled state. This is the maximally entangled state that we can get for two qubits. So you start with 0, 0, but you get a different state, just, just by exchanging particles. And this is nothing but a unitary operator acting on this state, right? So we can get at least some unitary operations 
just by exchanging vortices. And this is topologically protected. Why? Because they don't interact with each other uh, during this uh, exchange. They are never near each other during the uh, braid operation. So there is no interaction between them, and uh, they remain robust. So information doesn't change unwantedly. It changes only because of this long-range uh, arm of bone type of interaction. So when you count your bone state degeneracy, all the zero modes are like distinguishable? Uh, divided by yes. oh, I see. Yeah. When you fix your basis, yes. OK, so you can start with, with this basis, where you have more than uh, two vortices, one, two vortex here, two here, two here, and so on. And you can exchange a bunch of them, and after that, you get a linear transformation of those states. But can you get any desired linear transformation just by exchange? The answer is no. For my run of fermions, uh, you can easily see that that cannot happen. This uh, break, this type of braid is not powerful enough to give you uh, whatever you want. It just gives you a subclass of uh, operations. So it's not uh, universal. You cannot get any desired uh, unitary operation. In the afternoon session, you will see that we have some other types of excitations which can actually perform universal quantum computation. OK, uh, let me uh, mention example three. Uh, it's about integer quantum hall. <clears throat> so you all, you all uh, know about classical uh, Hall effect. So uh, we have voltage, uh, voltage uh, drop along this direction and magnetic field uh, perpendicular to the system. And we can measure uh, current in this direction. And they are proportional to each other. This current is proportional to this uh, voltage. And the proportionality constant uh, which gives us conductivity, or its inverse gives us resistivity, uh, has this form. So resistivity is proportional to the magnetic field divided by the density of light constant electrons. This line is the classical behavior. But when people uh, tried to do this measurement experimentally in the early 80s, they saw uh, deviations from this classical behavior. And instead, they observed these plateaus. So, for example, at this point, uh, quantum and classical behavior agree with each other. But if, when you change magnetic field, of, or if you change the density of electrons, instead of following this line, you get this. So this is more or less like a phase transition. So you have one phase here, one phase here, one phase here. They have different behaviors because this uh, slope is zero here, here, but it changes suddenly between this and that. So uh, you have a bunch of different phases instead of having a single phase like a classical system. And we want to understand this. OK, uh, how can we understand this? Uh, the simplest way is to consider the Landau level problem. Hamiltonian, uh, in the presence of external uh, gauge field, is this in two dimensional systems. Let's imagine we have a uniform perpendicular magnetic field, so del cross A equals B. And we can choose a gauge uh, such that AX is BY, but AY is 0. And this is called Landau gauge. If you go to this gauge, then Hamiltonian will have the simple form. In this Hamiltonian, uh, X doesn't show up. So X, so PX and Hamiltonian uh, commute with each other. And because of that, PX is just a uh, conserved quantum number. And we can quantize that when we have periodic uh, boundary condition along x direction. So p is 2 pi divided by lx times some integer. Okay. And if we plug in this number, this fixed number, into this Hamiltonian, we have a Hamiltonian which is a function of py and y only. And this is just a number. You see now. And we can rewrite that Hamiltonian which is a function of y and py in this way, which is nothing but a uh, harmonic oscillator oscillating around this point, which is given by 2 pi times m divided by Lx divided by Eb. So the center of oscillation depends on the momentum. Remember, this was momentum. And the frequency of this oscillation is related to the magnetic field. Just rewriting that Hamiltonian. OK, what is the uh, energy spectrum? 
Energy spectrum, as you see, is independent of M because center of oscillation doesn't determine energy. Energy is just a function of frequency. So energy doesn't depend on M, but it depends on N, which uh, means which Landau level uh, you are in, which uh, every function you take. So energy is omega times N plus one half. So you get one half omega, three half omega, five half, and so on. But each state is not a single state. There are a bunch of states with the same energy because M doesn't change energy. So M equals zero, M equals one, two, and, and so on. So these different states uh, with different M, they all have the same energy. And wave function is simply a plane wave along x direction times nth hermit function. Okay, what if I put chemical potential here in this, in this system? I, I assume the system is periodic in both directions, in x and y direction. For the periodic case, uh, if I put chemical potential here, all these bands below chemical potential are occupied. So I show them with this color. And the system is gapped, because if I want to excite electrons, I have to take electrons from this band or this band and create them on this band, and I have to pay some uh, finite energy. And at low temperature, I cannot uh, get this uh, finite energy. The system is insulated. And the wave function has this behavior. For m equals 0, I have one Gaussian for the lowest Landau level, because Hermit function uh, reduces to Gaussian for n equals 0. So I have one Gaussian here. For m equals 1, I have a different Gaussian for m equals 3, and so on. And uh, please note that the distance between two peaks is inversely proportional to Lx in this gauge. And uh, the width of each uh, Gaussian is Lb where LB is uh, 1 over school PB. OK, so uh, we get this picture. Now, what is the degeneracy of each Landau level? I told you by changing M, energy does not change. But how many M's do I have in that Landau level? We just saw that center of oscillation is related to momentum. But center of oscillation cannot be outside the system, right? So center of oscillation must be between minus Ly half and plus Ly half. And because of that, momentum, because gap y0 is proportional to m. So if I rewrite this in terms of m, it tells me that m must be between this number and this number, where g is phi divided by phi0. What is phi? Phi is the total flux, magnetic field times the area of the system. And what is phi0 is the quantum of flux, hc over e. So this simply means the number of m's that I can have in the system is g. So m is between this and th that and changes by 1. So how many m's do I have is simply g. And g is the number of fluxes that I have inserted inside the system. So the number of fluxes gives me degeneracy for the lowest Landau level. Degeneracy is number of quantum fluxes. OK, how about edge state? Uh, what if I cut the system uh, along uh, y direction, for example? So I don't have periodic boundary condition along y direction, but along x direction, I still have periodic boundary condition. OK, the system uh, at the edge has confining potential. So when electrons uh, go near the edge, they cannot go out of the system because there is a force that uh, keeps electrons inside the system. And that potential has this shape. OK, my Hamiltonian is not simply the Landau Hamiltonian. It is Landau Hamiltonian plus confining potential. But remember, why the center of oscillation uh, was proportional to uh, momentum. And when LB is small, then I can replace y by average of y. So instead of having an uh, operator, I just uh, write this as a, uh, as a number. C number. So if I replace y by its average, which is proportional to m, then I get this uh, level. So v is almost 0 inside the system, but when I get near the edge, remember, when m was very large, I was near the edge, either this edge or this edge. Very negative near left edge, very positive near right edge. So my bands 
They bend up near edges. Now let's put chemical potential somewhere. If I put chemical potential here, then all bands below this uh, point are occupied and above it are uh, unoccupied. But is this a uh, conductor or an insulator? It's conductor. Why? Because if I take electrons near Fermi energy, near mu, I can excite them easily with very low cost. So the system is conducted near edge. But inside ball, it's still uh, insulator. Because if I take electron here and I want to excite it, I have to pay so much energy. But here, cost is very small. OK. I can linearize and expand energy near uh, chemical potential. And if I do that, I will get these linear uh, dispersions. Group velocity here is positive. Remember, group velocity was the slope of energy. So the slope of energy here is positive. So it's like I have some right number of electrons. Electrons here go to the right. But at the other side of the system, they go to the left. So I have two edges. And uh, this is another picture of the same thing. So along x direction, I have periodic boundary condition. Along y direction, I have cut the system. And uh, these are Landau levels. And as you see, m is proportional to y. So big M means near this edge. Very negative M means near this edge. And I have two edges which are right moving uh, near this edge, near uh, the lower edge. I get uh, two uh, left moving states. How about conductance? How can we understand uh, quantum uh, Hall conductance and uh, plateaus in, in this picture? It's very simple. OK, when I, uh, so remember, I told you that if we apply voltage drop along this direction, so voltage is negative here, positive here, then I get current in the uh, <coughs> normal direction. Why? Because chemical potential must change in this way. Chemical potential must change to mu plus charge times scalar potential. And Vy near this edge is V half near the other edge is minus V half. So chemical potential is not straight line. It's this uh, line with non-zero slope. And if I focus on the edge state, initially V was zero, so, I, so the number of electrons occupying this band were equal to the number of electrons occupying this side of the band for V equals zero. But when V is non-zero, I get this uh, difference between uh, electron population here and here. So chemical potential here is larger, so I can ac accommodate more electrons. And they are all going to the right. So I going to the right is large here. But for this part, chemical potential is reduced. So the uh, electrons which are going to the left, their population is less. So I left is less than I right. So I get a current. And this current is proportional to V, the voltage drop between this point and that. OK, I is proportional to V, what is J? J is I divided by this uh, length. So I is J is I divided by Ly. You will see this uh, equation. What is N? Is N is the number of occupied bands. Because uh, when I put chemical potential here, I will get two bands. And for each band, I get this story. So each band contributes this much. OK, uh, very simple. Another important thing which we must expect for these uh, integer quantum Hall systems, and in general for quantum Hall systems, is the so-called spectral flow and charge pumping. Uh, what does it mean? OK, uh, let's take one uh, Lando level. I'm focusing on this band. And uh, I have exaggerated here so you can see these energy states at the edge. Okay. Energy state at the edge is linear. So E is proportional to V times momentum. But what if I apply some gauge field to the system? So remember I had this picture. What if I add, I insert some magnetic field inside this cylinder, which affects these lines? Because gauge potential at those points is non-zero anyway. OK, uh, we know that momentum must change in this way, because 
I must use covariant momentum. So energy is not just V times P. Energy is V times P plus this change. Here, if I do this, then derivative of energy with respect to dA is positive, which means these uh, energy states, they go up. But here, uh, if I change P to P plus A, derivative of energy with respect to A is negative, which means if I change A, if I increase A, energy decreases at these points. And what is A? A is phi, the flux that I insert, divided by Lx. And what if I change phi from 0 to 2 pi? If I change phi from 0 to 2 pi, it gives me 2 pi over Lx. But 2 pi over Lx was the difference between two different momenta, right? Two consecutive momenta, they, they had this much difference, 2 pi over Lx. If I do that, then this state goes to this state, this state, and so on. Every state moves in this way, in this fashion. Which means, because energy of that state, this state, its energy changes, and at some point it goes below chemical potential, so it must be occupied. So I have one more electron which is occupied in this edge. How about the other edge? Chemical potential was here, but this state escapes from the uh, chemical potential, and after that, I just have two electrons here. This electron becomes green because it's unoccupied. So I have one less electron here, one more electron here. And this is nothing but just the uh, uh, charge pumping. So I have pumped charge from this edge to this edge. Uh, and the amount of charge that they have pumped is uh, one electron. Uh, delta Q is E. And this actually has been measured experimentally recently in this paper uh, for photonic uh, topological systems. Yeah. Uh, since all your lethal levels, all your uh, energy bands are curved at the edge, mm -hmm. so I assume the chemical potential would not just intersect with one tunnel level. It, it depends on the chemical potential. If you put chemical potential high enough, you can cross uh, two or three or four bands. It really depends on chemical potential. And chemical potential depends on the density of electrons. But it depends how many electrons you have. Would it lead to anything uh, the conductivity changes, right? Yes. So, yeah, but other than that, then. Okay. Okay, so I, uh, I will spend like five minutes on what annual statistics and grade group is, and uh, I guess we will be done with this lecture. Okay, uh, what is a uh, grade group? Let's imagine we have two particles at point I and I plus one, and I want to exchange them. So if I exchange uh, the place of these two particles, it's like taking one particle around the other, because if I sit on side i, I will see that i plus 1 was on my uh, right initially, but at the end it's on my left. It's like half braid, half circle. Okay, so this is what we say. And I call this operator sigma i, which exchanges these two consecutive particles. But in 2 plus 1, uh, in, uh, sorry, d larger than 2, higher dimensions, uh, what is sigma i2? I just mentioned that sigma i is this half circle. And if I exchange them once again, it's like a full circle. So sigma i squared is this full circle. But what is this full circle in uh, more than two dimensions? In more than two dimensions, uh, first of all, these particles are just two points, two singularities. Okay? Other than that, I don't have singularity in this case for the moment. What I can do if I can I can take that circle and rotate it uh, in the third dimension. And what I can do is okay after that rotation I start shrinking the uh, path. And I can do that, and at the end I get just a point. So that path becomes zero, becomes trivial, which means sigma i squared must be one because it's like nothing. I have done nothing. So in higher dimensions, d larger than 2, two exchanges is trivial. Sigma i squared is 1. For any arbitrary uh, particles, it doesn't depend what i and i plus 1 are. They, they can be anything. So sigma i squared is 1, which means sigma i is either plus 1 or minus 1. So the wave function changes at most sign by exchanging particles in higher dimensions, in three or four dimensional systems. But in two dimensional system, something special happens. 
I cannot use the trick that I showed you. I cannot take this in the third dimension because third dimension does not exist. If I want to shrink this, I have to uh, pass this point. And this point is singularity. I cannot pass that. My, my space uh, becomes crazy at that point. So I cannot do this trick. And because of that, sigma I squared is not necessarily 1. In some cases, it might be 1. But in some cases, it, in general, it, it can be anything. So this is very special, and uh, the main difference between two and higher dimensions. OK, I can show this uh, in this way. The, uh, the perpendicular dimension, uh, direction, this direction is time direction. So I have one particle, and this is my world line, world line of particles. And I can exchange them. Uh, what uh, this relation tells me, sigma i squared is uh, different than sigma than 1, it means sigma i is different from its inverse. So if I exchange two particles in this direction or, or in this direction, I get two different answers. Okay? So this is a very important point. And uh, I can show that if I take three particles and I exchange 1 and 2 first, and then 2 and 3, and later 3 and 1, the final answer should be equal to this. Because at the end of the day, I have 3, 2, 1 here, and 3, 2, 1 here. So this order should not be important. And OK, with these two uh, things, I can define a well-defined group. It is called the artin ray group. And I can study representations of that group. But if I add one uh, more constraint, if I add this constraint, the ray group reduces to the famous permutation group. And we know that permutation group has only two, non has only two representations trivial representation, which gives us bosons, and non-trivial uh, representation, but one-dimensional, which gives us fermions. It's only uh, minus one when we exchange them. But for uh, d equals two, sigma i squared can be other than one. And when we study this group, we may get other representations. We may get non-abelian representations, for example. So in, two equal, in d larger than 2, braid group is the same as permutation group. But in d equals 2, braid group is different than permutation group. And it can have non-abelian representation. It can have matrix representations even with non-integer dimensions. It, it can have, for example, a square root two-dimensional representation. I will get to that point. But uh, anyways, abelian representations are abelian anions, which means sigma is just some number, it, it's a phase, but phase is not necessarily plus one or minus one, it can be any phase. Because of that, I call it anion, any phase, any comes from that. And uh, I may get uh, matrix representations of that group, and that gives me non abelian anions. And uh, that's it. So, I guess we are done. How do I see that the exchange is the same as going around in full circle? Uh, exchange? Uh, like exchanging particles is the same as? Oh, it is like half, you half grade. It's not full grade. OK. Yeah, it, it's like uh, it's half circle. Let me uh, show you this. OK. Uh, if I exchange i and i plus 1, I can sit on, uh, I can sit on this point. And what I see is initially, particle was on my if I look this way, particle goes on my left, right? I plus one. But at the end, it's on my right. So it has changed from left to right. So it's like half circle. This is sigma i. And let's do this again. If I exchange them again, it's like traversing this uh, path in this lower part. So that's sigma i squared. It's so I'm sitting on particle circle. i. Sorry? I'm sitting on particle i. Uh, yeah, you, you're, you're sitting on particle i. That's, that's it. Particle, yeah, particle i sees this as half circle. Other questions? Yes. So uh, in your integer quantum Hall effect description, you say that the chemical potential was rising at the edge. So what determines the scale at which it rises? So if it rises at a length scale which is smaller than the magnetic length, then this description doesn't hold anymore, right? Uh, OK, what I'm saying is uh, derivative of chemical potential equals electric field, right? Proportional to electric field. 
So at one point, chemical potential must be higher than the other because, because electric field is non zero. So this derivative, average of this derivative must be non zero. Uh, no, means? I'm talking about the case without the electric field. So mm -hmm. let's say you don't. Oh, without the electric field. field. So, so in, in that case, chemical potential uh, must be the same in, in two edges. Uh, sorry, sorry, I meant the energy levels. So, um, okay. The, let's look at the lowest energy level, and it rises. Okay. Close right. to the edge. Right, right. So, what is the length scale over which that rise is taking place, and how is large right. or small is it compared to the magnetic length scale? Uh, that's actually a very good question. So, if confining potential acts only within L B, then it uh, increases uh, momentum uh, energy only at this point because. Uh, the distance between two uh, ends in, in real space, delta y is magnetic length, right? I'm sorry, it was, uh, no, uh, let me show you this, yeah. The distance between two peaks uh, is actually not magnetic length. The distance between two peaks is inversely proportional to one over Lx, okay? So it's much smaller than Lb when Lx is large. So for, for usual samples where Lx is almost the same as Ly, this distance between two peaks is much uh, less than LB. Right? And you're saying, what if uh, confining potential acts only within LB region? How many uh, peaks do I have? So N times this number must be equal to LB. The number is proportional to LX itself. It's very big. So it affects the big uh, portion of the land of the Earth in that case. But if LX is small, then you're right. It only affects the, only the very last state or very first. Do we have the, some estimate of the length scale? Like we know what LB is, right? Oh, you, you're asking an experimental question, right? I don't know. A <laughs> millimeter? <laughs> yes. Uh, it's a very simple question. Follow that. So, so you. You always assume that uh, if there is a, uh, I mean, when there is the electric field, then you assume there is a the, the chemical potential drop as a linear. Can can it be non-linear? It depends on the uh, profile of electric field, right? Because derivative of mu is proportional to electric field. If your electric field is uniform, uh -huh. then it's linear. If your electric yeah, field I mean, has some crazy shape, some certain material which might be the, you have some... I guess for quantum Hall systems, uh, the electric field is, uh, sorry, the electric field is constant okay. because you have DC, a DC conductivity. Okay. And uh, mu being linear is not bad at all. Okay. All right, I think we'll have to stop there uh, to get our uh, break. Uh, we will resume at 11.30, so you have about 15 minute break to discuss more with the uh, lecturers or with each other. We'll see you back at 11.30. Let's thank Abu Akhan again.